During ADL training, the person working with the patient can incorporate all of the principles used in the bow bath approach. This is an area that, of course, has direct carryover into the patient's daily life and can directly affect the quality of life after discharge from the hospital. So the subject of ADL should never be taken lightly. Like transfer training, ADL training is a standard procedure in the rehabilitation of a hemiplegic patient. Jan Davis will now explain how the bow bath principles are incorporated into this very important aspect of the patient's program. Jan? Thanks, Susan. It's, this is an area that's not only for occupational therapy, but it's for physical therapy and nursing staff as well. And this is an area that has direct carryover. It's something that if we can do with the patients, and we teach them to dress themselves properly, and that's not just in the traditional method, but with the techniques that we'll be describing, it really can make a difference with the patients as far as how they can integrate the body and how they can reduce or normalize their own tone. Again, it doesn't have to be exactly this way, except for, I think, 95% of the patients can do it this way. If they've had problems before, like fractures or something like that, that's a different story. But most patients can do it this way, if they have problems dressing themselves in the way that I'm going to describe, it's normally because of fear. They have a lot of fear or they have perceptual problems or motor planning problems where they really don't know what they're supposed to be doing. The patient can now learn to break up his own spasticity. It's really sad to see a therapist work with a patient in the clinic, get his tone all normalized, he has nice selective movement coming in, and then you watch this patient get dressed as he leaves, and he's pulling his shirt on and pulling his jacket on, and the more he tries, the more he gets into associated reactions, he pulls back and increases his tone. So this is a part of our whole rehab program, the beginning and end of treatment sessions as well as dressing in the morning. We try to break up the typical patterns. Again, the typical patterns being the extension or flexion synergy of the upper extremity and that extension synergy of the lower extremity. And everything that we talk about is for those goals. That's what we're working toward. We've had enough workshops. We've given enough workshops around the country now. And we've gotten enough feedback from different therapists that we found that these techniques are actually working faster. The patients are learning these techniques faster after they've tried them. For some reason, with the, especially left tamis with the perceptual problems, it makes more sense and it works well. The patients seem to be more aware cognitively of what they're supposed to do. There are a few tips that I want to mention first. First of all, don't dress the patient in bed. This I see all the time in hospitals and rehabilitation centers. The patients are being dressed in bed, usually because fear on the part of the patient and fear on the part of the nurse or the therapist that they're going to fall. It's not normal to get dressed in bed. It's like one of my patients described, it's like getting dressed in a sleeping bag. It's difficult. Try it sometime before you have your patient get dressed lying in bed again. It's really difficult, and that's not normal. What we're encouraging, again, is normal movement, and the quality of life will improve. I like to have a patient seated in a normal chair next to the bed. A wheelchair is all right, but again, like Louise said, you don't get a nice position in a wheelchair, and I can't get as close to the patient. If I have them in a straight back chair, I can get real close to the patient, which brings me up to the next point. Make sure that the therapist or the nurse is always seated on the hemi side, or standing, or stu um, squatting down on the hemi side. That way, if the patient loses his balance, he'll go right on over, and you've got him. If I'm standing in front of the patient, he could fall off the chair. If I'm standing behind the patient, by the time I grab him, he can go over, and I can cause a lot of problems with my own back. If I'm right next to the patient, he has less fear because he feels secure. I feel as soon as he has a weight shift too far toward me, and I can control the situation a lot better. The other thing is look at how the sequence of how you're dressing a patient. Always start from the hemi side and use the same sequence every day, because if you do that, the patient has a better tendency to learn. So make sure that you do that. Now, we've taken a patient from Harmerville. Before you roll the tape, just a second, this patient is one I had not worked with before. We had done this patient with um, bed positioning, but he was just starting his ADL program and his dressing and self-care program. He has a lot of problems, and they become very clear in the tape, and I want to discuss those as we go along. So if we have the tape now, I can give you some ideas of how we would have this patient dressed in our techniques. First of all, he's sitting in the, at the side of the bed, and he's going to put on his undershirt here. 
When you're putting on a pullover or an undershirt or a sweater, the ideas are the same. First, find that hemi arm, the hemi sleeve, in this case his left sleeve, place it between his knees, and that gives him a goal. He sees that sleeve, the hole, puts his hand in it, and he comes right on down. And when you bring the patient forward like this, you're breaking up the extension synergy in the lowers, and you're breaking up the flexion synergy in the uppers by having his shoulder in protraction. Have the patient go ahead, put on his other arm now, his arm through the sleeve, and he can bring it up and over his head. That works real well, and make sure you keep the patient forward and nicely protracted, and he'll inhibit his own spasticity this way. The therapist is always on the hemi side, always. Don't leave the hemi side. Now, when he's putting on a button-up shirt, the same thing. He finds that left sleeve, He's going to come forward. He has that goal again. That hole is right there between his knees. He puts his hemi arm in his sleeve. If he has difficulty bending forward, help him along. Bring his shoulder forward and go ahead and slip that shirt up right up on his arm. This patient, you can see, has problems shifting his weight over. He's always putting his right hand onto the bed because he has problems shifting his weight over to my side. And he's very fearful. If he has a little bit of trouble here, go ahead and guide him. And he can reach his hand around to the collar either by his neck or if it's easier for him, the small of his back, he can do it either way. It doesn't make any difference here. When you have the patient button his shirt, start from the bottom. That way you make sure the buttons are in proper alignment. If you start from the top, often there'll be one button off and then he'll have to redo it. Now I'm asking the patient to cl clasp his hands and he's going to cross his legs with a little bit of assistance from me, and that's a nice way to have him cross his hemi leg over in order to put his pants on. It brings his weight forward, it keeps him from going into associative reactions, and it breaks up that extension at the hip. He puts on the left pant leg, or his hemi leg, goes in his pants first. Again, he has a little trouble with balance, so I want to make sure that I try and keep him in as much of midline as possible, and if he has problems here again, that frustration. Don't just sit and watch the patient. Help the patient. Don't just do it for them, but guide them as much as possible. And he can bring that all the way up to his knee here. And he'll clasp his hands again in order to bring that foot or his leg back down onto the floor. And the more he can practice this, the better off he's going to be when he's integrating. Now, he's going to put his right leg, his supposedly unaffected leg, into the, the pant leg here. That's more difficult than it looks because he has to shift all of his weight toward me, and that's scary for these patients. They don't like to shift their weight over to that hemi side. So I need to be right there for him. And this is the technique Louise showed, standing up. He pulls his pants up. As long as I'm there doing treatment anyway, I might as well stand up with him. There's no reason to teach him to pull up his pants sitting down. I can support him if I need to. I bring his weight over onto that side. It's a nice position, and it's a normal position. And he can go ahead and zip up his pants here. If it's easier for him to buckle his pants when he's sitting down, I'll do that with him. It depends on their tolerance at this point. Now, putting on shoes and socks, again, hemi leg first, hemi foot first. He bends forward, and look how nicely forward he comes, for he comes forward. The first time we did this with him, he could not bend this far forward. It's only because he was afraid to and he had some tone at the hip. The second time it was easy. He came right on forward and reached down to his toes. If he needs help, help him. That's fine to help him. And within two or three days, he'll start to get the hang of it a lot better. And have him put his shoe on at the same time. A little bit of energy conservation here that he puts on his sock and he puts on his shoe so he doesn't have to clasp and unclasp his hands too many times. I don't mind at all that his hand, his hand and his arm are dangling forward. That doesn't make a difference. And I'm going to talk about that after the break as far as the hemiplegic shoulder goes. Now, look at how much trouble he has putting on this sock. This is his good leg. He cannot get his weight off that foot. He has trouble shifting his weight over. That's why we try to encourage that as much as possible. What I would like to have this patient do is cross his leg. He has trouble again. But have him cross his leg, get the weight totally onto his left hip, and then pull on his sock. And then he can go ahead and just slide his shoe right on. The more you encourage the patients to follow these normal techniques, 
the less fear they're going to have, the more normal tone they'll have, and the more independent they can be in a shorter period of time. Putting on his watch, put it on the hemi arm instead of putting it on their good arm. Two things are accomplished. He can do it independently, and he looks at that watch a lot during the day, and it just encourages that much more contact with that affected side. Good. Does that give you some ideas then on how to do dressing? We went over that rather quickly. The ideas, they really do work. Again, it's breaking up that spasticity of the hip, coming forward, integrating both sides, clasping their hands, and you don't get this pulling back, the associated reactions that you get with your stroke patients in, in normal um, dressing techniques. Now, another thing that we can do when we're talking about self-care skills, we talk about washing up and shaving and those sorts of things. Now, undressing, before I go into the next part, undressing is basically the same as dressing in the reverse. For example, when a patient tries to take his shirt off, instead of letting him pull his arm out like this, going into a classic ex uh, flexion synergy, what you want him to do is lean forward and slide his shirt sleeve off this way, again, keeping that shoulder protracted and breaking up the flexion synergy. It works nicely. Let's go on to washing now and shaving. We have another tape, and I'd like to explain some more things during this tape, okay? Okay, here's a patient again. This is the same patient in his room. And this, I'm encouraging the patient here to wash himself in a sitting position. His arm is forward in the sink, in the wash basin, and this accomplishes a few um, specific goals. First of all, his arm is in forward protraction keeps it from retracting and pulling back. He can wash more easily under his hemi arm because it's not hanging down to his side. He can reach underneath and wash better. It's in his field of vision. It is not neglected. It is not off to the side, but it's in his field of vision. And another thing is he's getting nice sensory input from the temperature of the water and just the fact of the arm being placed in water. He gets quite a lot of sensory input in this position. If the patient can stand up, great. Have him stand up. That's fine. But if he needs to be seated, this is the best position for him to be in. If he has any problems of neglect, encourage him again to look toward that side, helping him to compensate. I like to do a lot of shaving with patients in standing. It's normal for men to shave and stand. Patients who are in the physical therapy clinic working on their tolerance and standing will often complain after five or 10 minutes, I want to sit down, I want to sit down, shave, and they'll work for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour because it's something they're interested in and it's normal. Even though he has no movement or function on that left arm, it's supported nicely on the sink, it looks normal, check for a weight shift here. Does he have his weight on that left leg or is he bearing his weight totally on his right leg? Shift, shift his weight over to his left and make sure he's in at least midline. Now this is a nice position for the therapist to be in. She has the sink in front of the patient. He can't go forward. She has the chair behind her and she's on his weak side. He is not going to fall and it's a very secure feeling and it's very normal. I encourage this as much as possible. Even if it's just during a treatment session during the day, I'll take him up to his room and do this because it really does work on a number of goals all at the same time. And it looks better. It looks a lot better. The patient feels better about it as well. OK, does that, that gives you a few more ideas of what you can do. I get excited about occupational therapy because I think a lot of the techniques that we learn in bow bath will only be carried over when they go home if they're trained to do these during normal daily activities. And in a lot of our techniques, if they're taught only in the physical therapy gym how to inhibit spasticity and how to get some nice controlled movement, they won't have that same carryover when they go home. So it's our job as occupational therapists as well as nurses and physical therapists to get these kind of principles and learning the controlled movements put into normal daily activities. And that's where I see the main emphasis for ours. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Jan. Next, we will take your calls and your questions about 24-hour management, transfers, and ADLs.
I am being told that we have lots and lots of phone calls, so let's get right to it, shall we? Let's take our first call. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm calling from Miami, Florida. Welcome to the teleconference. What's your question? Thank you. My question is, when the patient is flaccid and they have shoulder subluxation, would you still want to position the patient in bed on the involved side? Okay, this is a really good question. We'll talk more about shoulder subluxation and flaccid extremities, but it doesn't matter if they're flaccid, spastic, or sublux, they still can be positioned in this, in this way. It makes absolutely no difference, and it does not hurt the patient at all. In fact, it encourages more proprioceptive input and helps the muscle tone to, um, to increase. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to add that, remember, when the patient is lying on the involved side, his scapula is in protraction. Yeah. That is important. He's not on the head. He's not on the, the head, head of the humerus. humerus. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for your call. Shall we take another call? Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from New York City. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, I have two parts to my question. Mm -hmm. First, um, when the patient is positioned supine, there usually is an increase in extensor tone. Why wouldn't you want a pillow under the knees to help break up the extensor tone? And the second question is, do you really need to worry about developing a flexion contracture in supine? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, when we do position our people in supine, as Jan said, it's not the position of choice, but we inhibit the extensor tone by bringing the pelvis into forward or into anterior, an anterior position. Into, uh, so we don't have the retraction elevation, and that inhibits the extensor tone in the leg. And I think that's interesting about the knee flexion contracture because it does make a difference because this is about the only time the patient is really with full leg extension except maybe when he's standing, but he does not stand that much. And yes, I have seen uh, flexion contractures in the knee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for your question. Should we take another phone call? Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from, please? Portland, Oregon. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. If the patient has a great deal of abnormal plantar flexion and eversion, inverse, excuse me. We and we transfer the patient toward that involved side. Aren't we at risk in spraining the patient's ankle? Mm -hmm. I think that's another good question. And it, when the patient has problems with spasticity in that case, we make sure that the foot is inhibited before we start the transfer. And when you get the weight onto that foot, and he is really weight bearing, he will not be going into plantar flexion and inversion. And that's the main thing, the weight on the, on the foot. OK, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your call. Oh. I think was, let's take another call then, OK? Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Uh, Portland, Oregon. Another call from Portland. <laughs> Welcome. Go ahead. I have a question about uh, supporting a sublux shoulder in transferring. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, traditionally, we have used slings to, to support the shoulder while transferring. Do you want to deal with that now, or do you want to deal with it? That's something that I'm going to talk in yeah. length about right after the break, the slings and the problems yeah. of the hemi shoulder. So if you can hold on just a little bit longer, I think you'll get your question answered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, let's take a question from our studio audience here in Pittsburgh. Hi, go ahead. Hi. My name is Beverly Dole. I'm a registered nurse with uh, one of our rehab facilities here in Pittsburgh. Uh, my question deals with uh, activity, activities of daily living. Seeing your tapes today, um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of one-to-one -one bases that we deal with. And if we have a lot to do, should we uh, concentrate on one activity and complete the rest for the patient or uh, let them go ahead and, and struggle through on their own? That's a good question. We get that question a lot. And I think no matter what techniques you use, you have this problem with nursing in nursing because you don't have the time. What I do with a patient with low level of tolerance, or that's a real acute hemi, is I do as much as he can, and then the rest that I do for him, I try to do that in this guiding position like we talked about. The other thing is, is you try and do as much as you can with the patient. If it's training, it's training. If it's passive nursing, it's passive nursing. But when it's a rehab um, patient, then really try and get what you can going for the patient. OK. OK, thanks. Should we take another phone call now, OK? Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Uh, from Detroit. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. Thank you. 
I think you've actually addressed this, but could you go into more detail about the uh, early acute treatment before the patient is transferred to a rehab center? Uh, um, how much time do we have? It's another whole program. <laughs> I think the basics, they're written down in your manual. If you have your manual, again, we're talking about room position, bed position, ADLs, and encouraging as much stimulation to that hemicide as possible. And that, that's a point that, that deserves to be stressed and restressed yeah. all over again, that, that the Bobeth principles can be applied right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You don't wait until mm -hmm. X days or weeks down the, down the road to begin. There are a home. lot of specific techniques you can do with training. Mm -hmm. Okay, should we take another phone call then? Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Tucson, Arizona. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. Yes, uh, we have two questions from Tucson. Mm -hmm. The first one is, I heard Louise mention water therapy. Uh -huh. How does Bobath approach water therapy? For example, what changes occur with spasticity and postural reflexes and reactions in the water? <laughs> water therapy. Mrs. Bobess says, we're not froggies. We don't go into the water. <laughs> but we do take some of our patients into the water, and we work a lot in the water on head control. You better say in Valens you do that. Okay, this is in Valens, right. And um, we do work on head control, which leads sort of into balanced reactions. Sometimes when the patient's frightened, and of course there's a lot of upthrust, a lot of turbulence, it's a strange situation, then the patient will be very spastic. So we have to just try this out with, with different people. Bobat's answer to that once in a, in a course yeah. that I had from her was you look at the spasticity or the yeah. tone level and if it increases then you want to back off just like in any other treatment program. Mm -hmm. yeah. And our second question is you have discussed weight bearing in standing. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend upper extremity weight bearing in quad and elbow propping positions? Yeah, that's for, yeah. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you we'll demonstrate much. a little bit of that later. Also. Yeah, later. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take another question from the studio audience then. Hi. Yes, ahead. I'm Nancy Lewis. I'm a registered nurse from the Pittsburgh area. Does Bobath positioning take more time than normal nursing procedures? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think oh, two I people just, are very anxious to answer I just that. Said, can I answer that? <laughs> take it. <laughs> and take it. Okay, I'm ready. It's a critical uh, question. Yeah. It is a good question. And I've been teaching a lot of nurses around the Swiss in Switzerland, and they'd always ask me this, and I kept saying yes, but I wasn't really sure, so I decided to do the night shift. And our night shifts are 11 hours, and I only did it for a week, but at least a week. And I did do all the positioning, I just worked right with the nurses, and I know it works and it goes quickly. It's really quick. We position them two or three times a night and it was really fast. It's easy. And so, when the patients are trained, you come in, they sort of halfway wake up and they're already positioning themselves. We just have to sort of put the final touches on them and they're immediately back to sleep. It mm -hmm. takes practice to be it able to do it that quickly, but sure. Yeah. yeah. But a nursing department is going to be positioning patients anyway, so they yeah. might as well do it in a, in a manner that's, oh, that's And consistent. it doesn't take more time than, than normal. Oh. Thanks for your Thank attention. You. Mm -hmm. Let's take another phone call. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Uh, Topeka, Kansas. Welcome to the teleconference. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be discussing this, but uh, wheelchair positioning and bed positioning for the patient has spasticity, especially the upper extremity. It works real well with a flaccid patient, but uh, how about the spastic patient in bed? There's a second question, too. Okay, want to deal with this first? It, it works just as well for the spastic patient as the flaccid. It just takes the therapist to know how to inhibit tone, inhibit the spasticity, and bringing them um, into the proper position. Mm -hmm. But you can do it just as well for spastic as you can for flaccid. It does, again, you can't learn all of the techniques here just on a four-hour teleconference. With special um, training, that would be no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you had a second question? Yes. Uh, transferring the patients to a higher level than the mat from the wheelchair. Our nurses have to deal with very high beds in our hospital, mm -hmm. and it's much more difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, that's a good question, in that you will have to bring them to standing first and then do the pivot. But the main thing is on going up and down. Once you've got the patient standing, they're coming to the chair, or they're in the chair, they stand, they're standing with their back to the bed, and then the trick is that you make sure that they weight bear on the involved leg and lift the uninvolved hip onto the bed and then after that, the involved leg. And exactly the same with coming down. 
you put the involved leg down first, get the foot on the floor correctly, support the leg, and then bring the uninvolved leg down, and then turn and sit. That's how it goes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm sure, a very common situation, That's common, having yes. to transfer mm -hmm. to higher levels. Actually, can I just add something real sure. quick? If you ever have problems with something like this, try it yourself. See how a normal person does it, and you can figure out the movements you need. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the last question we have time for in this portion of the program. But we will open the lines up once again before we're through. So if you have not been able to get your question in, do keep trying. There is still a good bit of time left. We're going to take a 15-minute break now, and then we'll be back with a lot more information for you. Once again, you'll see in your TV screen a clock telling you how much time is left until we resume. And once again, when you hear our music, you will know that there's only a minute and a half left in the break. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to Bow Bath Techniques for the Stroke Patient, coming to you live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We hope you had an enjoyable break and got a chance to stretch your legs and rest your eyes for a little bit. While you're settling in for the last part of the program, we'd like to take this opportunity to tell you just a little bit about the sponsors of today's teleconference. Please watch this. <laughs> The Harmerville Rehabilitation Center is a private nonprofit facility located 15 miles northeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Surrounded by 16 acres of secluded woodlands, this modern 200-bed complex functions like a small community. Its open interior design encourages interaction among staff members, patients, and visitors. Dedicated to the goal of adding life to years, Harmerville provides a diversity of programs. Each is designed to assist patients in reaching their highest level of independence. Stroke, spinal cord injury, and amputee patients comprise the majority of the patient population. Specialized programs have been developed in the areas of chronic pain, head injury, and hand rehabilitation. Harmerville's treatment philosophy is referred to as the total person approach. This approach requires the dedication of a team of rehab specialists. Under the direction of a managing physician, these specialists work closely together to maximize each patient's functional abilities and self-esteem. To fulfill the educational needs of the staff, patients, and family members, an educational resources division has been established. Developed primarily to fulfill internal training needs, the division also provides educational opportunities for allied health professionals. Faculty from around the world regularly present information about treatment techniques that can be employed in the rehabilitation of the physically disabled. These educational activities are presented in the center's modern seminar facilities and are supported by a staff of educational specialists and a comprehensive media production service. Through the dedication of a team of treatment and supportive personnel, Harmerville strives to provide the highest quality of patient care. Having heard about our sponsors, we now move on to our next content area, which is the hemiplegic shoulder. The treatment of shoulder pain, the shoulder hand syndrome, and subluxation have generally been topics about which there hasn't been a lot of good information available. And often, the information that is available is conflicting. There are differing points of view on the use of slings, splints, and other equipment. But the shoulder area is a vital focus of a rehabilitation program, and it's important for therapists, nursing staff, and families to understand how to prevent problems in this area. Therapists at the clinic Valens have developed some interesting and useful techniques to deal with the special problems of the hemiplegic shoulder, and Jan will now share some information about those techniques with us. Jan? Thank you, Susan. This is, some, this is a topic that I could talk for hours on. I get really excited when I talk about the shoulder and the problems of the shoulder because for so long, I didn't know what to do with the problems in the shoulder pain with a hemiplegic patient. Before I went to Valence and started getting my training there, I'd worked for several years 
as an OT and OT director in California, and we had patients with shoulder pain, swelling of the hand, shoulder hand syndrome, and we really didn't know what to do with our patients. I went to Switzerland. I took a, the three-week bow bath course. I came back, and I had six months to work before I went to Switzerland to work. I came back to California for six months, and I tried some of the techniques I had learned. We cut down the incidence of shoulder hand syndrome from about 50% of our patients down to about 15% with some very simple techniques. And I want to share some of those things with you today. It's frustrating for therapists talking about the shoulder because they really don't know what to do. Like we talked about observation skills, first what we need to know is the basic functional anatomy and physiology of the shoulder girdle, the shoulder complex, and what it's made up of. And we have to know that first. I'd like to divide my lecture now into three areas. First, on the functional anatomy. Second, on specific problems in hemiplegia and what happens to the hemiplegic shoulder. And third, I want to talk about some treatment techniques that you can do to prevent shoulder hand syndrome. And if you do have a shoulder hand syndrome, what you can do once you've got it. So those are the three areas I'd like to talk about. We know that a painful shoulder can inhibit the entire rehab program. When we have that problem with shoulder pain, the patient doesn't want to get dressed in the morning. He doesn't want you to touch his arm. It hurts, it bothers him, and it really affects the entire rehab program. Patients don't have to have painful shoulders. A couple weeks ago, I just heard a doctor say to a family member, that's a part of a stroke, and it's not a part of a stroke. We don't have to have shoulder pain. I cringe at what I used to do in treatment. I know I did more harm than good to my patients. And I want to help other therapists know that they don't have to make the same mistakes. I took a lot of my information on the anatomy of the shoulder from Caillet's book. It's in our bibliography, The Shoulder and Hemiplegia by Rene Caillet. I think he gives a good explanation of shoulder problems in hemiplegia and the basics in the anatomy and physiology. As far as treatment goes, I think the areas and the techniques that we've devel developed in Valence is something that's special and not many people in the States have been aware of some of the things they can actually do with the hemiplegic shoulder. We could probably spend days on this. Since we don't have days, why don't we get right to it and look at the shoulder girdle. The first thing we have to realize is that we're not looking just at the glenohumeral joint, but we're looking at seven joints that make up the shoulder girdle. And all of these seven joints need to work properly in order to get full, pain-free range of motion. Now, we have a chart here, and you have the same thing in your book. And we can go ahead and name these. The first one is the one that we think about most often, which is the glenohumeral joint right here. That's the one that we're going to talk the most about, and that seems to be the most crucial. But we have to realize there are six other joints here to be aware of. You have the suprahumeral joint. You have the chromioclavicular joint. These, when you first look at the names of these, you think they're incredibly long, but they all tell exactly where it is. The acromium and the clavicle. The chromium cl clavicular joint, scapulocostal, the scapula and the ribs. You have the sternoclavicular, the costosternal, and the costovertebral. So you actually have seven joints that you have to be aware of. Let's look at the glenohumeral joint. That's the one that's the most important and the one that seems to cause the most problems with the patients. There are certain points in the anatomy of the glenohumeral joint that are important to know in order to have um, a stable shoulder joint. The first thing you need to realize is that it's a, well, we know it's a very mobile joint. We can move our arm around a lot, and there are several reasons for this. We know it's a ball and socket joint. This is something that's very common. Most people know that. But we have to look and see that here's the glenoid fossa. The glenohumeral joint is made up of the gleno glenoid fossa and the head of the humerus. This is the greater tuberosity, the head of the humerus. Only 60 degrees of 180 degrees are articulating. That means only one third of the head of the humerus is actually coming into play with the glenoid fossa. That's not very stable. That allows a lot of mobility, but it also sacrifices a lot of its stability. But if you look, it's one third of the head of the humerus as, compa as compared to 180 degrees. That makes a big difference when it comes to looking at the glenohumeral joint. Now, another thing that's important to realize is that the glenohumeral joint is something that we call an incongruous joint. 
that might be a term that's relatively new for most of you. Most parts of our body and joints are working what they call a congruous joint. It, it moves about its own axis. Now, the glenohumeral joint is what we call an incongruous joint, which means it changes its axis as we move. Here's another drawing taken from Cahiers' book. The head of the, hum the humerus itself, if it didn't shift its axis downward, when you lifted your arm up, this greater tuberosity would come in contact with the acromion. Here's the acromion. Remember, it's that part sticking out on the, on the scapula. If you didn't shift that head of the humerus downward, as you rotated your arm up, you would come in contact here, and you could cause a lot of trauma and pain to your shoulder. Now, in, in normal people, and what you need to have is this head of the humerus will shift its axis downward. So it changes its axis here, shifts the head of the humerus downward, and that means that the acromion here is going to clear the greater tuberosity. OK? Now, the next thing that's important to remember is that in adduction, when you're standing with your arm to your side, it's in adduction that it's a mechanical support that holds the head of the humerus into place. It's not a muscular support. As soon as I bring my arm into abduction or forward flexion, or, for example, if I change my body position here, which means my arm is into abduction, then it's a muscular support, and I need the muscular control to hold the head of the humerus in place. Um, a doctor, Basmagian, and you've probably heard of him, came to Geneva a few years ago and did a workshop in Geneva. And he was trying to impress upon us this point. And what he did is he studied 25 medical students. And he hooked up an EMG to the deltoid, and I think it was the supraspinatus. He had them hold suitcases with 25 kilos, which is a little bit over 50 pounds. And there was no muscular activity at all. Nothing fired off. As soon as he brought them into abduction or forward flexion, it fired off like crazy. So the muscular contraction is necessary when that arm is not hanging into an, an adducted position. If it's adducted, then you have a pure mechanical support. This is important to realize because there are a lot of questions with the um, problems of subluxation. We'll talk about slings. We'll talk about a number of different things. And you have to know what's going on here to make more sense as far as the treatment goes. Next, don't forget the scapula. I don't remember in college that this was impressed upon us in treatment techniques or in the basics of the shoulder that the scapula is so important. You have to have the scapula gliding in order to have full range of motion at the shoulder that's pain free. Now, it doesn't only glide. There's a certain ratio that the scapula has. This ratio is described, again, in Cahiers' book, and it's a two to one ratio. For every two parts that the humerus moves, the scapula is going to glide upward one part. So when I raise my arm up, I'm not only moving my humerus, my scapula is also going to be gliding upward as well. And for example, you can look in your books if, if this is hard for you to see. Go ahead. When I want 90 degrees of abduction, when I want to have my arm out to 90 degrees, the scapula is going to glide upwards a total of 30 degrees. The humerus is going to glide actually 60 degrees. If you add the humerus and the scapula together, you're going to get a full 90 degrees of shoulder abduction. Now, if we talk about 180 degrees and we look at a 2 to 1 ratio, how much is that scapula going to move? The scapula will move 60 degrees. It's 2 to 1 ratio. How much does the humerus move? The humerus is going to move 120 degrees. The scapula goes 60. The humerus is going to go 120. And you're going to have a total of 180 degrees of shoulder abduction. This is important to remember because if you ever try to raise a patient's arm up without looking at the scapula, you can cause pain and trauma to that joint. That's really important for us to know that. The muscles of the scapula that attach to the scapula are also very important. We know that if we try to raise our arm up without getting this nice scapular gliding, the first thing you'll get is 
a pinch of the supraspinatus. Let me look over here at the skeleton for a second. Now, if you look at the skeleton here, the supraspinatus inserts on the scapula. This is the acromion, okay? It goes underneath the acromion and it inserts onto the head of the humerus. Now, you can see by the way that this relationship is, it helps to hold the head of the humerus in place, but also the way it is, if you try to raise that arm up without having that scapula glide, the greater tuberosity can hit against the head of the chromium and that supraspinatus is going to be caught right in between. And that can cause tearing and um, trauma to that joint. And that's what a lot of our patients have when it comes to the pain in the hemiplegic shoulder. Two other things are important to remember. We've talked about downward rotation of the scapula and upward rotation of the scapula. We have to remember which muscles will affect upward rotation of the scapula. Gets back to kinesiology. It's been a few years. Huh? Okay, first you have the trapezius and you have the serratus and anterior to aid in upward rotation of the scapula. Which muscles affect downward rotation of the scapula? Okay, that'll be the rhomboids, the levator scapula, which you don't normally think of. You think of elevation of the scapula. The levator scapula is placed that it helps in downward rotation, and also the latissimus dorsi is going to aid in downward rotation. These are the muscles that are most commonly spastic in the hemiplegic patient around the shoulder girdle. You don't get spasticity in upward rotation. You get that retraction, downward pulling, of the shoulder, and that's what you see in hemiplegic patients, is that downward rotation of the scapula. So what happens in hemiplegia? You get spasticity around the scapula, and that doesn't mean that the whole arm has to be spastic. Sometimes the arm's flaccid, and you still have hypertonicity around the scapula. It pulls it into downward rotation, which means that you don't get the gliding, and this patient is not able to get full pain-free range of motion because they don't have the upward gliding of the scapula and this can be very painful. There's something else that you're going to see with hemiplegic patients. Now, this is someone who's sitting up straight, just like you or I would. Everybody will probably shift in their chairs now. When you're in this position, the scapula is in proper alignment. You have just a deduction of the, the humerus, which would be in this position, no problem. You can see, actually, here, if you look real closely, the glenoid fossa is, it's a very shallow, um, almost like a dish. It faces upward, it faces anterior, forward, and it faces laterally. And what this does is it cups the head of the humerus in place. Any time that you bring that scapula into downward rotation, what are you doing to the head of the humerus? you're bringing it into abduction. If you look at the humerus in relationship to the scapula, it's no longer in adduction, it's in abduction, and you lose that muscular, the um, mechanical stability, and this person is depending on muscular contraction to hold that into place. Another thing happens with hemiplegic patients. We look at shortening of that hemiplegic side. Remember Louise talked about that? The hemi is often shortened on that hemi side. When the spine or the back, and you have lateral shortening of that side, again, you have the same downward rotation of the scapula. The humerus is dangling to the side, which is actually now in an AB ducted position, and again, you lose muscular control. And that's something that you have to be very much aware of. That's why positioning is also so important for the hemiplegic patient in order to maintain that proper alignment of the scapula and the humerus. Now, another study was done. Oh, I have to mention one more thing. Subluxation. This is a question that we get. We've already gotten two or three questions at the last session. I get questions wherever I go. What about subluxation? My patient has a sublux shoulder. What should I do? The first thing that we have to remember is subluxation does not cause pain. Now, that's something different. And again, this is controversial, but we've talked to a number of people We've been doing this for years in Valens, and from my experience now in the States with people who've been doing the same techniques, it's proven itself 
Subluxation does not cause pain. It's what you do to a sublux shoulder that causes pain. It's that trauma that you cause to a sublux shoulder that is going to cause pain with that patient. Subluxation itself is not a problem. It's a problem for therapists. It's a problem for doctors. People don't like to see a subluxed arm. It is not a problem for the patient. A do, um, there was a study done, I think it was in Norway, by Nahensen, and he did arthrogram studies of 32 hemiplegic patients. He found that 40% of the patients had a tear of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff, the supraspinatus, and the other muscles, the sit, remember, infraspinatus, teres minor, all of it of the rotator cuff, that had 40% of the patients had a tear. I've heard doctors say up to 70% of patients by the time they leave the rehab centers have a tear of the rotator cuff. That's where most of the problems are. He also said that 10 out of 11 patients with pain had tear of the rotator cuff. So we're not saying that subluxation has, is causing pain for patients. What we're saying is what you do to a sublux arm is causing the pain. Now, when does this happen? Well. If somebody does a transfer, they grab onto the hemi arm and they try to lift the patient out of the chair, right there it can cause trauma. I've had patients that come in, they have a swollen hand, painful shoulder, and I say, what happened? I don't know. You went home yesterday. Did you do anything different? Nothing. Did you take a bath? Yeah. Did you have trouble getting out of the bathtub? Yeah, it was all right. My, my wife helped me out. Did she pull on your arm? Yeah. I mean, it can take so little to do that. Therapists or nurses who range arms without looking at the scapula can also cause tra trauma and damage to that joint. Something that we would never, never use. You know the reciprocal pulleys? Tape the patient's hand on one end, goes through a pulley, and they're doing this. Think of what they're doing to their shoulder. Every time they pull down with their strong arm, they're bringing their arm into full flexion or abduction, and nobody's looking at the scapula. Again, that can only cause pain and trauma to someone who has spasticity around the scapula, and this is so important. Now, we need to take a look at one more area when we're talking about the anatomy and physiology of the shoulder girdle, and that's circulation. And this is something that's often forgotten when we talk about the shoulder. A couple things to remember. Kaye describes in his book that there are two major pumps in the shoulder girdle. First of all, you have the pump in the axilla here, and that is going to affect a lot of the circulation going down to the hand. And you have a pump in the hand. Actually, you have two pumps. One is on the volar surface, and one is on the palmar surface. The pump that's on the volar surface has to do with the lymphatic and the venous drainage. The one on the palmar surface has to do with the arterial supply. And that's why we see the patients with this ballooning of their hand is because they can't pump those fluids back up again. Now what you're seeing is the arterial supply it comes from the heart. Gravity aids it down, comes right on down to the hand. That's no problem getting from the heart to the hand. The problem is getting it from the hand back up again. We have to pump those fluids back up again. And this is done with movement at the shoulder. There's also little valves. In the, in the veins here that help pump the fluids back up. And these pumps here in the hand and the axilla are very important in order to pump that fluid back up. Now this is important to remember because this is going to have an effect on our treatment approach. First of all, these pumps require three things in order to work effectively. First of all, you have to have repeated movement at the shoulder. And that's why we often ask our patients to clasp their hands and do some exercises on their own. It not only encourages them to do the range of motion and to incorporate both sides, but that active movement at the shoulder helps the pumps to work effectively. The second thing you need is the clenching and the releasing of the fist. Now, not all patients are able to do this actively, so we need to also help patients to do it passively. The same thing happens when you're jogging or hiking in the mountains. You notice that your hands start to get tight and swollen, and your automatic reaction is to do this. You get elevation, you get the um, clenching and releasing of the fist, and you're also working on shoulder movement in order to get the swelling down. So you need repeated movement at the shoulder, the clenching and releasing of the fist, and you also need to have elevation of the arm. The arm should not always be dangling down to the side. It should be elevated when possible. Kaye states in his book that failure or impairment of the pump in the shoulder or the hand 
for any reason can lead to a painful, disabling condition called the shoulder hand syndrome. Now that's something important, especially if you're working with these patients and you see a lot of shoulder hand syndromes. Anytime you have failure in one of those pumps, it can lead to this condition. He also stated that prolonged holding of the arm in a sling at the side for any reason may also initiate this, this syndrome. Interesting, huh? Why would that be? If you hold your arm in a sling at the side like this, why could that initiate a shoulder hand syndrome? It's blocking off the pumps. You're not getting the movement at the shoulder. You're not getting elevation. This is not elevating the arm and the patient is not taught to clench and release his fist. So you have to have those things. When we talk about the shoulder hand syndrome, there are three stages of the shoulder hand syndrome that I want to identify for you. Okay, why don't we take a look at these three stages of the shoulder hand syndrome. Okay, in the first stage, usually you'll see limited shoulder range of motion. This is something that almost everyone here and everyone out in the audience has seen if they've worked with uh, stroke patients. The swelling of the dorsum of the hand is something that you'll see. The skin becomes shiny and often red. Limited range of motion in finger flexion. Most patients have trouble in spasticity in their hand. These patients have trouble coming into flexion. Their fingers are stiff and straight. They're hypersensitive to touch, pressure, or any variations in movement, which means they don't want to be touched. And the last thing is, is you see a lot of pain in wrist extension. If you can catch the patients in the first couple days after the onset, you can make a big difference and you can reverse the whole, um, the whole um, symptom of the shoulder hand syndrome. Now let's look at stage two. Okay, in stage two, the shoulder pain usually subsides and the range of motion increases. So whatever your treatment was, you think, great, it's working. Less pain, better range of motion, I've done the right thing. The problem is, is that the edema of the hand subsides, but the fingers are becoming stiffer and you're not going to get those fingers back again. Even if they have some potential later on, once they're getting stiff like that, it's hard to reverse it. Hair and nails appear coarse. You'll see this in some of our slides that the hair and the nails on the hand become actually coarse. The sensitivity decreases, but you'll see osteoporosis on x-ray. And sometimes doctors will take an x-ray at this time to get a clinical diagnosis of the shoulder hand syndrome because it will show up on x-ray. Now in the third stage, this is pretty much, at this point, it's the point of no return. This patient has a hand that has atrophy of the bone, skin, and muscles. The limitation of the hand, wrist, and fingers are increasing, leaving the hand painless, but in a very useless and atrophied and clawed position. And those are the three stages of the shoulder hand syndrome. Often you see the third stage when you have a patient come in as an outpatient or when your patient has had a second stroke, you might see the, um, the symptoms of a, the third stage of a shoulder hand syndrome that's happened sometime previously. Okay, let me talk about another subject now. I want to talk a little bit about slings. Okay. This is an area that we all feel very strongly about when we work with our patients. We do not use slings of any kind. No slings. I see a lot of people, their mouths drop open, and I can imagine out in the television audience the same thing. We don't use slings of any kind, and I want to explain why. First of all, we've talked about what causes a shoulder hand syndrome. We don't want this patient to be in this position. Second of all, we want to make sure that the patient does the movements we've talked about. Now, there's another thing that's very important when you talk about slings. It's the patient doesn't have to take care of his arm, it's not integrated, and it's just stuck to the side of his body like this. But the, why is the reason we put on slings on a patient? Because you don't like to see a dangling arm. So why do you put on a sling? We've already discussed that subluxation is not a problem. Subluxation itself is not a problem and so you don't have to worry about an arm that's down to the side. When a patient's sitting in his wheelchair, it will be raised on a lap board or on his lap. If he sits at a table, his arm is placed on the table. If he's walking, let it go down to the side. That is not gonna cause any problems. We have sublux, pa sublux shoulders, patients walking around the clinic all the time, full range of motion, no swelling and no pain, no problems at all. And it this has been for years and it's not been a problem. It's what you do to a sublux shoulder that causes the problem. People say, well, what about the bow sling? 
That's a sling that was shown in her book that was published in 1978. And they tried putting a roll under the arm, and it looked as if it made a difference. It felt like there was less subluxation. But what actually happened, instead of the arm being subluxed downward, it was pushed into lateral subluxation, which didn't help at all. What else would you expect to happen when you have a roll under your arm? The problem of circulation. That's where one of the major pumps would be located, and you have a problem in circulation. And several therapists in Sweden and around the world were noticing problems with edema. They wrote to Berta Bobath, they discussed it, and they realized that they really didn't need to have this roll under the arm. And I have therapists say, but what about a little roll? Just a little roll like that. No, you don't need any sling, anything under the arm. It is no problem. Now, I have a few slides that I want to show you. These are slides that I've taken in Switzerland. I brought them along here today. And I want to show you some pictures of some of the patients that we've been working with. OK, in the first slide, you can see that this patient has a subluxed shoulder. You can see that it's very clearly subluxed. You can see the gap there. If we look at the next slide, you can see it from the back. There, you can see it a little bit more, the subluxation. And look at that atrophy of the supraspinatus. Do you see that big indentation on his shoulder, the top of his shoulder? That's the indentation, and that's the atrophy of the supraspinatus. Now let's look at the next picture. He has full range of motion, no pain, and obviously a subluxed shoulder. And it looks like a very flaccid arm. OK, if we look at the next one, we can see that it's actually not a flaccid arm. He has some movement coming in, and he has potential here. Subluxation usually reduces with time because of increased tone and control at the shoulder. But you do not have to sling a patient. OK, let's look at the next one. Here are some pictures of the shoulder hand syndrome. This woman has a shoulder hand syndrome. You can see that her right hand, or the hand on the left side of your screen, is swollen. It's got the fingernails are coarse. It's kind of the hair is different. It's a different color. If we look at the next one, the next slide, you can see that her fingers are very stiff. It's hard to pull them into flexion. What do you do with someone once they have a shoulder hand syndrome? First of all, in the next slide, you can see that we put their arm into a bucket of ice and water. It's like a slush. And we do it only for a few seconds. We go in, one, two, three, out, in, one, two, three, and out. And I put my hand in there, too, and I feel how cold that is. And it's cold. But that gets the swelling out right away. The edema goes down. And then in the next picture, you can see that then we're encouraging this flexion of the finger and the clenching of the fist to try and push some more of that fluid out. And we're using a bottle brush here just to stimulate the, the um, palm of her hand in order to get more finger flexion. Now, we don't use any splints with one exception. And in the next slide, you can see if a patient is in the acute stage of a shoulder hand syndrome and they have swelling of the hand and their wrist is dropping down, we've got to do something. We want to get the wrist up into extension, and we want to allow for MP flexion. And we do that by making a short cock-up splint. It's like a gutter splint. And in the next slide, you can see that they've done it here with Plaster of Paris. It doesn't have to be Plaster of Paris. It can be any other splinting material that you use that's stiff enough to hold its shape. And it's only make sure you get below the, the um, crease to allow for MP flexion. And you want about 30 to 40 degrees of wrist extension. In the next slide, you can see how we put this on. We put it on with an ace wrap, going from distal to proximal. We're going to wrap her arm in a spiral manner, and that helps to increase the push of fluids back up her arm. And this is something she can wear and at the same time do her exercises with clasped hands. The next slide will show again how this looks when it's fully um, put onto the hemi hand. This is only a temporary thing that we do to the patient is it's not something she is going to wear over a long period of time. OK? Let me see if I think that's the last slide. OK, good. I wanted to mention again that there are a few things that we need to do in order to prevent shoulder pain and problems in the first place. And we have a few minutes now that Louise and I are going to do a few things here together on the mat.